Let's just bow in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for the cross. We thank you that you are willing to endure the cross that we might have life. Thank you, Father, that Lord Jesus, when you left us on the earth, you sent to us the Holy Spirit. And that we have you, Holy Spirit, indwelling us so that we might know more fully in our lives the life of Jesus. And so I pray that as we speak today of that life and things that can hinder, I just pray that you might speak to our hearts this morning in a special way. For we pray in the name of Jesus, because only he is worthy. Amen. In our last lesson last week, we looked at some biblical illustrations that we must do before the Holy Spirit can fill us. We need to cast out idols out of the heart, which is his temple. We must deny or die to self on the cross, a cross that we're to pick up daily. And we're going to conclude now this part of our study today by looking at some other hindrances to being filled. And then we're going to move on to look at finding the secret of our walk with the Spirit. And we may not get to some of that this morning time-wise, but we'll see. Hindrances to being filled. First of all, the Bible tells us in the book of chapter, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, Grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. H.A. Ironside says this about grieving the Holy Spirit. He writes, Observe, He is the Holy Spirit. He detests sin in all its forms, pride, lust, selfishness, worldliness, in every form and shape of degree. He is most sensitive to neglect, and he is easily grieved. Yet how many of us have never seriously sought to clean house that we might be suited temples for his indwelling? The Holy Spirit, he says, is more sensitive to moral filth, to spiritual defilement, than the most delicate and fastidious lady could be to vulgar and de degrading living conditions. And the word says, grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Verses 31 and 32, he says, suggest the kind of house cleaning that is required if he would be made at home in our lives. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be you kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So we cannot... Be filled with the Holy Spirit if we have grieved him by sin in our life that has not been dealt with. Secondly, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19 says, Quench not the Spirit. We're not to quench or resist the Holy Spirit. This next verse is not a command, but it comes from the message of Stephen. Remember when Stephen, just before he was stoned, he had a message that he preached to the Sanhedrin. And as he was preaching to them, he said this in Acts 7 and verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do you. Quenching and resisting the Holy Spirit go hand in hand. To quench the Holy Spirit is to know that he is speaking to you in some way, and you make a choice to put that thought down and not listen to it. It could be while you're reading your Bible. It could come while you are listening to a friend who sees something happening in your life and he's trying to warn you. It could come, and you might do that when you're being convicted, listening to a message and choosing not to respond to it, or any other number of ways 
Anything come to your mind? When we make that choice, we are resisting what it is that he's trying to communicate with us. Now, of course, I'm sure that none of you would have done this, that you heard your parents, like your mother, calling you. And you knew, you knew full well what it was that they wanted, but you chose not to go to find out what they wanted, and you went the other way instead. Or, maybe they did tell you what you wanted, and you whined, but Mom, do I have to? Oh, that must be muscle memory. That felt too familiar. <laughs> It should go without saying that when we quench, when we resist the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit convicts us of something and that's what we do. Do I have to? Or we just, I'm not going to think that way. When we do that, there is no way that he can fill us. We have quenched him. Now, thirdly, some hindrances that there are some spiritual enemies battling us against being filled. We have spiritual enemies that will fight us at every turn to keep us from accomplishing obeying his command. Now, saying this is not meant to scare you away from wanting to be filled, but again reminding us that this is not necessarily going to be simple and going to be easy. First enemy that we have is the flesh. In a previous lesson, we talked about that being filled with the Spirit, and we talked about the fact of the need to put off the old man. And the old man is not our father, it's our old man that is connected to the sin of Adam, going back to him, and all that we get because of him, the nature of sin. Romans 6 tells us that we're identified with Christ in his death, and that our old man was crucified with him. Therefore, legally, it is dead. The problem is, it doesn't know that it's dead. It's still there, and it still thinks that it's alive, and it still is going to try to get us to fulfill what we've always done when we lived according to the old man. It's our flesh. But when we get saved, we're supposed to put off the old man. We put on the new man, who is Jesus. So if the old man is dead, why are we tempted to live like him? Because there's a part of us inside us, a spiritual part in us, that also did not get saved when you got saved, and that's our flesh. Our flesh is the spiritual side of us that was connected to this old man. It's still there, and it's still very much alive, and it's still very much desirous of fulfilling its own desires. And we'll be talking more about the flesh a little later. And then enemy number two is Satan and the powers of darkness. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 12, Paul talks about the fact that we need to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and so forth. Paul gives us a positive command here, but also a powerful reassurance and a promise. And the command is something like the one to be filled with the Spirit, and that it is to be continuous and passive. We are to be strong in the Lord by putting on our armor. We are to put our confidence in Him, but it is His strength and the power of His might that will make us strong. And so we're to take our strength not from within us, but from the Lord. 
His power is almighty. It's infinite. And He is on our side in this battle against this enemy. And so we are to stand in confidence with His enabling us. Now, someone might be tempted to say, well, if living to be a spirit-filled person is that hard, then why would I either want to be one, a believer, or why would I want to take the effort to live like one? Well, it's a good question. It would be an honest question. I have just two thoughts. I'm sure there are probably others, but I have two thoughts in regards to that. First of all, we would want to be spirit-filled, and we would want to go through the struggles that it would take to live in such a way that the Holy Spirit can live us because the rewards are so great. Only a couple of examples. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25, Paul says this, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, the prize. <clears throat> and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate or self-controlled, self-disciplined in all things. Now they do it, <clears throat> excuse me, the natural runners that run in the Olympics, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it. We run this race. We live this Christian life for an imperishable crown. We will not receive that crown if we do not live in such a way that deserves it. A runner in the Olympics is not going to win the race if he stops. Oh, hi, Mom. Oh, hi, friend. And then goes over to talk to them. He's not going to win. You and I are not going to win the crown, the promise that's been given to us, if we don't run the race according to the way God says it needs to be run. James says, blessed is the man that endures temptation. That's where I was talking about a while ago about staying under. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. I can't say this too strongly, but I personally believe that that crown that is being spoken of there is one that we can receive now. It's a spiritual crown, and I believe that it's what Jesus was talking about back in the book of John, chapter 10. And he said, I am come that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And so I believe that when we endure temptation, when we live rightly, we might know that abundant life that Jesus promised to those who are his children. Secondly, it's worth it to do that because we are not left to do it all by ourselves. The same Holy Spirit who is desiring to fulfill us, or to fill us rather, is also with us here to enable us to accomplish it, to enable us to live for Christ. As we saw in Paul's prayer for the Ephesians in chapter 3 and verse 16, that we need to pray for ourselves as well as we pray for each other. Remember that we saw there that he, God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So the riches of God's glory all of his power, all of his omnipotence that he is, is made available to us to enable us to live for him. And that we are to pray that he would grant us to be strengthened with that awesome might by his spirit, to be able to live the life that he wants us to live. So that leads to another question. Okay, Gary. 
you've given some reasons as to why I should want to, but do you, are you telling me that I've got to attain perfection first? Well, we actually answered that question a couple of weeks ago in that long introduction that I gave you. But the answer is no. We don't have to come to live a life of total perfection. Now, there are those who believe that you can get there. The Bible does not teach that. God gave us the promise that we've looked at already in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, one of the things that we have to be very careful of is that we don't presume on God and say, well, I know if I pray, God will forgive me, so I can just go ahead and do this, and I can pray and he'll forgive me. Now, that's presumption. The psalmist, numbers of times in the psalms, asked God to keep him from presumptuous sin. But we do know that if we sin, we can confess our sin. And when we confess our sin, the promise is he will cleanse us. And at that point, we are just as clean as if we had not sinned again. And at that point, because we are clean, if there isn't something else buried away there someplace that we need to be clean from as well. But at that point we've confessed our sin and we kept, have kept up in confessing sin as we have sinned, then at that point we're clean and we can be filled. We have to make the right choices and we make the right choices with the aid of the Holy Spirit as we're going to be finding out how that happens. And we Enabled, he enables us to live in obedience to God. And then he can fill us. So as we've seen previously, while we're not promised that living to be filled in the whole, with the Holy Spirit will be easy, we are assured that God is for us. He is there to help us and he will do that. And we can say with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The things that he will strengthen us to do are the things that he wants us to do in obedience to him. How he strengthens us is going to be found now in the next part of our study as we discuss our walk after the Spirit. And I want us to look first of all at finding the secret in our walk after the Spirit. We haven't looked at it uh, much in uh, Romans chapter 6. That would be a great study. But in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, I believe there are three of the most important passages in all of Scripture. And if you want to turn to a passage, I'm going to be talking eventually here out of Romans chapter 8. But I believe that these three chapters may very well be chronological in the life of Paul as he related his understanding of the truths that he learned and the progression that happened as he learned these truths the progression that came about in his life and in chapter 6 we find our identification with Christ his death his burial and his resurrection, we talk there about our old man and how our, our old man died with Christ, was crucified with him. And so we are free then from the power, the, domin the domination of sin, and we are alive as those who are now alive to God. We're to live as those who are alive to him. We're no longer to let sin reign. We're to yield our members to as instruments of not yield our members as instruments of unrighteousness, but we instead were to yield ourselves to God and our members to Him as instruments of righteousness, because we are servants to whomever it is that we choose to obey. I've used the word choose in these past messages a lot, because it is a matter of our choices. It's our choice to grieve, to disobey or to obey. Chapter 7, when you come to Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about losing this battle. 
He knows that he's identified with Christ. He knows he's supposed to yield himself to God. He knows he's not supposed to yield to his members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But he's a devout, a devout Jew, and a devout Jew obeys the law. They obey God. And now that he knows that he ought not to sin, he's finding it even more difficult to keep the law. And he finally comes to the after, end of chapter 7, and he cries out in desperation in verse 24, Oh, wretched man that I am! Who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? I can't do it! Chapter 8, he comes to where he talks about finding the secret. I've referred to a book a number of times. I haven't quoted from it, but it's, They Found the Secret. And we've talked about it before. It relates to stories of well-known and some not so well-known believers of the past of how they found the secret of being filled with the Spirit. And the secret was you read through the book and you read each of these testimonies about how they found the secret. It's different with each one. And as the Holy Spirit worked in each of their lives, they came to realize this truth, some particular truth for themselves, and they believed it. And when they believed it, the Holy Spirit worked His wonderful work in them, and they were filled and their lives were changed. I believe that's what happened here in Paul's life. Paul was struggling. He was doing everything that he could to live the way that he was supposed to do. And the things that he knows that he ought to do, he doesn't do. The things he knows he ought not to do, those are the things that he does. And he finally makes that cry that we just imitated here a moment ago. But I believe he found the secret that these other people, and he began to believe it, as we need to believe it and apply it to our lives. He learned the answer to his dilemma with a new realization of how his identification with Jesus had and would deliver him when he answered his own question in chapter 7 and verse 25 by saying this, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, you might say, well, Paul, you already knew that about Jesus. And so we might expect then that Romans chapter 8 would continue with this thought of the life of Christ in him. And indeed, it is found there, but it comes from a totally different perspective, a new vital discovery that Paul made. And we learn about it starting in verse 1. Paul writes this. The first part of the verse, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Jesus himself taught that in the book of John chapter 5 and verse 24 when he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now that's a glorious truth for all who come to faith in Christ that there is no final condemnation of having to stand before God someday and be then judged and cast into the lake of fire. But then Paul takes a surprising twist and he adds the important truth that he's come to learn. Verse 1 again, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now I don't know what translations all of you have here, if you're not looking at the King James. But it's possible that I just read that verse and you're looking at it and you say, well, that's not in my Bible. That last part, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. It's one of the problems with the new translations, just one of them. They've removed that vital truth because they believe that it doesn't belong here. That it's somehow copied back from verse 4. But I say it belongs there because it is the truth. 
There is not only no condemnation by God, but as we learn how to walk after the Spirit, there will not be any other kinds of condemnation either for those who walk after Him. When one no longer walks after the flesh, but now lives in obedience to the Holy Spirit, and thus not sinning, there will also not be any self-condemnation, beating ourselves up, or from other people brought on by the failure to live rightly. Nobody will be able to say, po pointing a finger at you, do you know what you just did? If we've been walking after the Spirit and obeying Him, they won't have anything to accuse us of. And if we are walking after the Spirit and obeying Him, neither will the enemy, the powers of darkness, the accuser of the brethren, have anything to accuse us of either. Because we are walking after the Spirit in obedience to Him. Paul has learned this. He struggled in Romans chapter 7 with his flesh and yielding to his flesh. And he's rightly condemned himself. He's, we say today, he's beaten himself up over the fact that he cannot live right. He can't do the things that he knows he ought to do it the way he knows that he ought to do it. And he's finally come to this, to realize that as he would walk after the Spirit in obedience to Him, there's no longer any self-condemnation. Now there's an important contrast here that we're just going to mention and then we're going to have to leave it, I'm afraid, for today. The contrast is in beginning here in verse 1, there's a contrast between walking after the flesh and walking after the Spirit. Now we already talked about the flesh as being a part of our fallen nature. It's the natural spiritual state of man, but it's still present in the believer. It's that tendency in us that functions apart from and lusts against the work of the Spirit in a, in a believer's heart. Now, does that sound like anything that we've talked about just recently? How about when we said that we didn't need to deny self? And we described what self is. Think of it this way. Take the word self. Think of it. S, okay, you've got to go from that side. All right, self. S. E L F. Now spell it backwards. S. What would it be? Backwards. F L E S. And now I'm going to add an H. Flesh. Our self and our flesh are basically the same. Our self is that which wants to yield to sin. Our self, our flesh, is that which wants to be in charge. It wants to sit on the throne. It wants to be the first so that the natural tendency which is in us to live for self and the flesh is to fulfill all of one's selfish desires. I heard a message on the radio yesterday in the car for a few minutes and I didn't hear the whole message. It wasn't somebody that I knew and I didn't listen long enough to find out who it was. But he had some very interesting, two very interesting points about the flesh and faith. The flesh is only interested in either today or the past. The flesh is only interested in what it wants right now, or it'll look to the past to find some kind of an excuse to explain why I am the way I am and why I want to do the things I want to do. It wants to fulfill its selfish desire right now.
Now, we all fall for that sooner or later. How many young people, and I have to admit I was not a good teenager, and I was one of them, I had the false idea that as long as I didn't go the whole way, I could do whatever else I wanted. And it was wrong. But how many young people like myself want to fulfill their sexual, lustful desires in the name of love and then regret it when they get pregnant? Or they don't marry the person that they played around with and they have to confess as I had to do to my wife seven years after we got married and tell her I did not keep myself for you. I did not keep myself pure for you. I thought some of those girls were the girl I was going to marry, but I didn't marry any of them. And there was more than one. Because I thought I loved them. Maybe it wasn't love. I wanted to fulfill my selfish desires. And I am so ashamed of it today. We could go on about other wrong desires that we have, all of us have, of different kinds. I hope you get the idea. Faith, on the other hand, looks forward. It looks forward. Remember what Paul said in the book of Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forth, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Faith takes God at his word as he speaks through the Bible and he obeys because God has already considered the consequences. The young people that I was just talking about, including myself, did not consider the consequences of what it was going to mean if I obeyed, if I lived the way that I was living and I made the choices the way that I was choosing. It didn't occur to me what I was going to have to do to my, confess to my wife someday. I never considered those consequences. And when we walk after the flesh, we don't consider the consequences. But God has already considered the consequences. He's already put in his word the way that we ought to live so that we can avoid them. For example, in the illustration that I just gave, God in the commandments said, Do not commit adultery, either before or after marriage. Why? Because if you commit adultery, there are consequences. And God knows those consequences. And so to keep us safe from those consequences, he gave us a command. If we will obey him, we won't have to experience what those consequences are. Faith takes God at his word, believes what he says, and then does it. And he has given to us his Holy Spirit to enable us to do that. The flesh is always in rebellion to God. The flesh will always resist God's ways and his character. Faith keeps a proper perspective of who God is and trusts that he always has our best interest at heart and lives accordingly. We're going to have to leave it there this morning. But I ask you this question. As I've been talking this morning about choices, and as I've been talking about living after the flesh, and I've been talking about how we have a tendency to follow after the flesh, and we talk about the choices that we make because we haven't looked ahead. 
Has God the Holy Spirit spoken to you about something that you need to deal with in your life? There is a prize out there that God has for us if we will live a life of obedience to him. We'll be able to hear him say one day, well done, good and faithful servant, but he also will give us an abundant life that he desires us to have today. I have five sons. We taught our sons, you look at every girl out there as somebody else's wife, and you keep your hands off. And even the girl that you think that you're going to marry someday, you keep your hands off until the day that her father gives her hand to you in marriage. And praise God, to my knowledge, they did. I didn't. And there are things that may be in your life where you have disobeyed God and you've quenched the Spirit, you've grieved the Spirit, and you need to make it right with Him. Do it today. Let's pray. Don, we're going to skip this hymn. Don, I'm going to have you come and close us in prayer, please. I know he thought it was going to have a hymn before, but I'm going to skip that this morning. Don, you pray for us, please. What a wonderful Savior we serve this morning. One was willing to give his all for us. Help us, Lord, somehow to give all back to you. There's many out there this morning, Lord. Lord. Help us, Lord, as we go to this world, no matter where we are, we're at home, children, we all can be part of spreading the gospel. How we need you in our lives, Lord. Pray, Lord, that you be with us. As many mistakes that we have made in our lives, Lord, we cannot correct them, but you are willing to die for us and love us, and help us to love you. Be with us more as we go to our homes, wherever we are, help us to be with us to you this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.